like the beam, it's time for Nerdy for 30, the podcast where we talk about nerdyish movies for 30-ish minutes. My name is Kevin Bauer, aka The Critic's Choice. With me as always, is the people's champ, Tim Keck. Today, we are talking about potentially the last installment of the DCEU before whatever they call it when James <laughs> Gunn takes over. That's right. It's Blue Beetle. Now, I'll dive right into it. I thought that this was 45 minutes of a very nice movie and then, you know, uh, two hours of a ridiculous piece of garbage. <laughs> Tim, your comments in the movie theater make me think that you disagree. I, uh, my, my expectations were on the floor. In fact, I'd started start digging up some concrete to make room below the floor in case uh, the bar started dropping even more. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised as someone who assumed this would be unwatchable. I found it watchable. Uh, am I going to be watchabling it again? Probably not anytime soon. I like the actors. The Blue Beetle costume looks kind of cool. And the rest of it is real rough. Yeah, I can totally see James Gunn lifting this actor, this character, maybe George Lopez and bringing them back into the DCU somewhere and it being good. I can I can if Blue Beetle showed up in another movie with a with good writing and a better director, I think I'd pop for him. I think I'd be excited. Yeah, I'm not excited for this movie. I don't want to see Blue Beetle, too. This was not great. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you. You know what? I, to use the James Gunn analogy directly, it kind of feels to me like the Suicide Squad, where in the first Suicide Squad movie from David Ayer, you had the cast of characters. They seemed to love each other a lot while they were filming it. It seemed like there's all the talk with that movie about all the different versions of that that came out. But the movie that we were left with, despite these characters seeming really fun, there wasn't that much there for them. And then you look at what's happened with Harley Quinn since and everywhere they took Margot Robbie and you look at what they did with even people like Joel Kinnaman, where I, I don't even remember the character's name. He's uh, Rick Flagg. He's like right? the soldier that Flagg? just hangs out with him. Yeah. Yeah. I got nothing from that guy in the whole first Suicide Squad movie. And then in this Suicide Squad, he's at least a fun straight man to have around so yeah. he can find like little bits of everybody to pick and choose he's already got a lot there with Shola Maradwena like I agree that the Jaime character is super super fun obviously the George Lopez character was too but I'm right there with you if he shows up in anything else I'll give it up I'll pop I'll I'll give him the pop yeah I liked I liked I think I liked a lot of the actors I liked uh Jenny Cord thought she was fun. I like the sister a lot. I thought the sister could have been really good and kind of I feel like a wasted opportunity for her because I don't know. I thought she was goofy and charming and could have been better done more comedy stuff mm -hmm. and really just ends up being like a little like quiet downer for the most of the movie. <laughs> uh, Harvey <laughs> Harvey Gillian's in it for some reason. Dr. Sanchez. I don't know what he's doing here. It it seems crazy that he has this weird he, he turn. Again, he's awesome. He's so good in uh uh with that shadow the vampire uh show. Yeah, what is it? What we do uh, in the shadows. What we do in the shadows. He's awesome in that. I've seen him in other things. He's great. And just I don't know. It just seemed like a lot of these guys were uh, a lot of wasted opportunities here. The dad I liked. What did you think of Susan Sarandon? In this. I thought she was the second worst actor in this movie. Really? This movie okay. gave me nothing for Susan Sarandon. She was swinging at something. I think I couldn't tell. I really couldn't tell if she was acting in a different movie or if she was just not taking this seriously whatsoever. <laughs> what about you? You seem to disagree. I don't know. I, I didn't have a huge problem with Susan Sarandon. She did what I thought Susan Sarandon would do in these kinds of movies. I don't I don't feel like I was surprised at all with her performance. Right. Has she done a lot of superhero stuff? I don't think so. I don't think so. The superhero format is is pretty particular. And I think she just kind of played it over the top a little bit to kind of catch the tone for it. And uh, I don't know. I think that's 
That's what happens in superhero movies. Well, who, okay, so then who's number one for you? Oh man, but like, don't we can't just reduce it to that's what happens in superhero movies. I mean, this genre has some real heft to it at times. Yeah. Okay. She's hammy. She's hammy. She's, she's a corny villain. She's yeah. hamming it up. Yeah. To be no, fair, right. they didn't do her any favors from the script. It's ridiculous to me every single time I see the premise of the villain being some tech CEO and then being so hands-on with every little piece of the evil stuff happening in the company. I've interacted with CEOs of companies before I've interacted with the CEO of the company that I work for and they don't touch that much. They stay very high level. If there was an R and D team doing wild shit with the mythical scarab, they would not be there. They would maybe check in to see how it's going. They would be <laughs> reviewing very high level reports of what's up. But they show her like boots on the ground. She's she's in the helicopter when they are like kidnapping Jaime and attacking his family. She's physically there. She is so entrenched she's getting fingerprints over everything it's just there's just no way that somebody does the head <laughs> of that it's the same shit with the guy in ant-man no way is this guy this hands-on with everything that's happening. <laughs> you're 100 percent right i don't know i i think it's just because i had such low expectations that uh i i, I knew this was gonna suck I knew this was going to suck. And so the fact that it's sucking isn't blowing my mind as much. <laughs> but you're making an incredible org chart point about this, that the CEO is not involved with any of this stuff. She Never. should be far away. You know, she should be like uh, Charlize Theron in like Fast and Furious, where she's off in a tower somewhere. <laughs> and then she has these henchmen doing stuff like that's that's what a CEO does. They're like not involved in this stuff. They're yeah. getting away. They're doing whatever they want to do. The the idea of an R&D team kind of going rogue, I guess that's kind of, uh, you know, um, Spider-Man Far From Home vibes, right? Where it's like the mm. R&D team for Iron Man, I guess, like uh, or like the a lot of Iron Man's like tech or Tony Stark's tech crew like goes and, and kind of makes all this stuff. That's a funner vibe. It's a funner vibe if this is like a weird offshoot and Jenny Korg is like the CEO and she's trying to stop them, stop people inside her own company from doing this. But it also yeah. seems like Susan Sarandon's just the boss has way more power than Jenny Cro Jenny Cr Cord. Yeah. What does Jenny Cord even do? What is her role at the company? She's high up, but she's not high up enough to tell Susan Sarandon to fuck off. But it's yeah. it's Jenny Cord's company. But also Susan Sarandon is in charge of everything. Yeah, I think she's on the board, but she doesn't have a controlling number of votes. And I'm sourcing this entirely just through the last like two episodes of Secession here to figure out how <laughs> this aspect of things work. She made the mention that she's there. She's at the board meetings. And yet it seems like she spends most of her time going around to different places doing humanitarian work and posting to her Instagram where she has no followers. <laughs> and could that's not, funny i noticed this in the movie she could not get at jenny cord her handle is at jenny cord one this is inexplicable to me the only thing that i can think of that justifies this is if they wanted to make a twitter like a, a instagram account for her as like a social media promotion tie-in for the movie and then the reason the posts were getting no likes is because they were showing screenshots of the actual social media engagement with this I mean, this is also exactly what would blow up on Instagram. Beautiful woman traveling the world, mega rich, doing humanitarian work. Like, mm. come on, a couple swimsuit picks. She's at a million easy. I don't think she's she's not a swimsuit pick kind of person in this. No, it's something like, you know, picking up trash in Bali and she's like in a bikini with like a snorkel on Jesus. and she's like holding up a bag with, with garbage in it. You know, something like that. <laughs> Just like a little tease and millions instantly. While we're on the Jenny Cord topic, Lauren had a really funny observation, which is that she doesn't dress well in this movie. I don't know if this is a costume <laughs> designer thing or whatever, but all of her clothes look like she got them at Express. Like she looks Gosh, like she paid funny. too much for really low quality clothes. Yeah. Yeah. She's also, I mean, I think she is older. I think she's like 28 or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, how do you say the Blue Beetle guy's name? Jaime or Jaime. Shola? 
the actor. Sholo, Sholo. And Sholo is like 22. And I, I, watching it, I was like, these people aren't aren't the same. She's like really dipping. She just seems so much more mature and put together than this guy uh, in a way that I was like, I don't know why she's she's hung up on this uh, this kid. You know, <laughs> this is weird to me. Oh, big time. I don't know why he was hung up on her because I said Susan Sarandon was the second worst well, actor in this sense. movie. I think Jenny Cord was the worst actor in this movie. <laughs> I thought she was god awful. Dude, she had nothing to do, though. How many times like <laughs> there were like f- legit five times in the movie where the family has a conversation and they're like, well, what do we do? And then she steps up and goes, well, actually, I could help. Like she's been standing like 10 feet away from them, listening in on their conversation, waiting for the opportunity for her to step forward and help them out. And she is like a billionaire, right? Like that's, Mm -hmm. that's the vibe. She is mega rich. And most of the problems this family has, and most of, as most of the problems in real life that real families have could easily be solved with a billionaire friend. (laughs) And yet every time they look at her full of shock and awe that she is willing to help them out at a certain point, I'd be like, yo, you got this. (laughs) This is where you tag in. Like if I like if we went to brunch every weekend and Jenny Cord was there at a certain point, we'd be like, Jenny, you got to start treating for brunch. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not splitting this bill anymore, Jenny. (laughs) We saw we saw the quarterly reports. You got the eggs. All right. We don't need any more of this. And they why can't they do that in this movie with Blue Beetle? It's it's she's so their character is so weird. Makes no sense. It's. (sighs) <sighs> crazy you really think she's the worst in it though yeah yeah i think she's really yeah. bad so then you love george lopez i thought george lopez was phenomenal <laughs> i thought it was great he was much needed levity but also he was there he had the depth in the scenes that needed the depth i don't think he provided the depth necessarily of like jaime's dad i legit loved jaime's dad Oh, yeah. I somehow did not see it coming that he was going to die. I would have been a lot more moved by his death if his actual death scene and then the afterlife reuniting scene weren't completely ridiculous. But the idea of him dying is very sad to me. Lauren made a point after the movie about Nana and holding the giant gun. Yeah. And... And how it's kind of like a bit that like, oh, the little uh, either the undersized character, the old character or what some kind of like scrappy underdog ends up picking up the biggest gun and is like, let's go. Mm -hmm. And that's a trope. Oh, yeah. And she presented it like she's tired of it because she's seen it so much. I think on the other hand, and I didn't feel that way. And I was thinking about it a lot. And I think I just love a trope. I love a trope. I think it's great. I think it's funny. I like seeing the same stuff over and over again because I just want fun, dumb action. (laughs) But I want it done well. And when it's done bad, then I'm like, well, you guys just blew it with this thing. Like, not only were you unoriginal, but you weren't good either. So it seemed like they really fumbled the bag with Nana. It seems like they really Mm. fumbled the bag with another one of my favorite tropes, which is loved one dies and you talk with them in the afterlife while you're having a near death experience. (laughs) This is one of my favorites. This is a great thing. This is Harry Potter, Dumbledore. This is uh, I can't even think of anything. I mean, this is Black Panther, man. Yeah, this is this is Michael B. Jordan sitting on a throne and Cherise seeing him. Uh, And we get time, by the way. Oh, that was amazing. I mean, I hate Cherie, but I don't hate Cherie. I'm just not crazy about Cherie. But damn, Michael B. Jordan looked good, man. He looked real good up there. That was cool as hell. Man, I was excited. Michael B. Jordan for T'Challa. I'm calling it. Uh, You got to do it. Bring him back. Make him Black Panther. Um, I feel like it happens a lot. It's happened enough. Definitely in like high fantasy and stuff. It happens all the time. And yet. In this one, it felt so bland and I was sad that the dad died and yet bland, bland, bland. They're like (laughs) nodding. He also is like somehow it's heaven, but the blue beetle costume is like just floating out in space. And dad's like, go do it. Go be the blue beetle. (laughs) Also, dad, what are you doing here? You know why I'm here. And it's like, fuck, I don't know. It's just the whole thing was fumbled so badly 
And it's a bummer because those are two things that I really enjoy. I love watching old people hold guns. I love watching uh, <laughs> dying people speak to loved ones on a distant plane. And, you know, it's a shame we didn't get either of those. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. That was such a strange afterlife sequence. He said that the reason he said, I finally understand. Yeah. What my journey is, it's to bring me to this point. So his journey was to be dead. And then after he's dead, talk Jaime into doing what Jaime was already doing. Which he said that earlier in the movie when they were just sitting and talking. He's like, well, my journey's led me here. So really, this guy is just going to say whatever he's doing at the moment is where his journey is. (laughs) That's kind of zen. That's kind of (laughs) cool. It is kind of zen. It is kind of zen. But if you keep whipping it out, it it loses its effect after a while. Whereas George Lopez. You know, if the dad was dying, George Lopez must be exhausted from just carrying this movie on his back. (laughs) He had he had they had fucking nothing going on for his character. They so many times they faked out that that his character died and brought him back because I think they could tell he was just the only thing happening in this movie. Why is he following him around and not the sister? Like, I think quickly they were like. I don't know. I feel like in another movie, the sister would be would be helping out the brother. I think she's good enough to have been that character. Mm -hmm. But George Lopez, man, just any critiques with George Lopez are just like how much he had heavy lifting he had to do to like carry anything going on in this movie. Sure. The only critique that I have for him is the fact that when they got into the Blue Beetle, the what Blue Beetle mobile, he Mm -hmm. climbs into the fortress and one of the legs of the Blue Beetle mobile spears a guy through the <laughs> chest. And he just goes, oh, and he thinks it's super cool. I mean, he just murdered. He just murdered a guy. And while we were watching it, I was like, well, OK, it's defensible, though, because these guys are attacking them. And I was like, they're attacking them because they're trespassing. They're the ones breaking and entering. <laughs> Dude, I mean, these are also just like, you know blue collar workers just trying to get through the day and get home. You know, I yeah. know they're not decision makers, right? It's like, it's like yelling at a cashier. You know, these are like the cashiers here. They're not the ones who set the price. You know, they're just on the front lines shooting, shooting this monster that's coming towards him. And the whole time Jaime is like, no, we don't kill. He's telling the suit. We don't kill. We don't kill. We don't kill. At a certain point, I was like, I don't know. I think you should start killing people. <laughs> you know, like once that once they killed his dad, that's when he started killing. But like you could have saved lives if you just if you'd start murdering people more. I mean, I think the moral of this movie is that, you know, the second someone spites you, you should take their life <laughs> and <laughs> and not let them go on to hurt any anyone else ever again. You know, death is the only only release for people who uh, who tr- trespass against you. Um, yeah, I don't know. <sighs> Kevin, what do you think about his his like whole relationship with the scarab and how the beetle wants to kill and then at the end it's like actually no that's not what we do and then it starts speaking to him in spanish and it just it felt it just it felt insincere to me for some reason it also doesn't make any sense based on the comics right the scarab is a a, is like a, a weapon of mass destruction that's dropped on our planet to ultimately destroy the planet or at least control it so that like the alien race that created it can come and like take it over. And yet there's none of that. It starts kind of like that, but then immediately the scarabs like, nah, I'm cool. Just whatever you want to do. What'd you think about that? Yeah. I think relationship is a strong word for their connection. (laughs) I think, uh, they had several conversations. I don't know that I ever got a feeling for, what the suit was or what the suit wanted could have been really cool if what you were just talking about with the idea of once somebody slights you you need to start killing could have probably been an interesting character perspective for the scarab to have there's a lot of stuff that almost felt like was left over from previous draft of the movie because they keep talking about him building this bond with the suit this thing the scarab chose him for a reason it's not super clear why it chose him particularly if this thing in the beginning wanted to kill and Jaime already had the strong impulse of we do not kill I'm not saying I want Jaime to be a killer because I think that's at odds with I do his character. <laughs> but 
<laughs> I do think that I want more exploration into that, or I don't want it there at all. I just don't want to half-assed. It'd be fine if it wasn't there at all. He just finds a weapon. It doesn't need to be framed as a weapon of mass destruction. It can just be a weapon. They can not even know it's a weapon. They can just think, of, look at this weird beetle that's given off an energy signature. Also, maybe this is the right time for this. It looks too much like a beetle. It's ridiculous <laughs> to me anytime a piece of alien technology looks exactly like something that already exists on Earth. I like it when it's a little bit more magical realist, when it can kind of be interpreted as looking like a beetle. But when it just straight up looks like a beetle and it has like kind of beetle like logos on the bottom, not for me. <laughs> it reminds me of like the dragonfly ships in Dune where it's like this. There's no way this is the most efficient way to fly. Yeah, <laughs> like, this is a, this feels like a stretch. You know, I'm sure somebody tried it. They've seen dragonflies fly and they're like, well, let's give it a shot. But so, so simple and a little too over the top, I guess. But yeah, Um yeah, what did you th- what do you think of this new trend of the superhero costumes matching the comics so directly? Because it seems like from Marvel's Phase Four forward, they've really decided it's going to look exactly like it does in the comic. Hmm. I think I'm good either way. I'm yeah. good either way. I think if they, as long as they just, as long as it's consistent and they lean into it, I think it's cool, man. I like seeing the costumes. That's what we're expecting. But I also don't mind, you know, a Logan take where it's just like really gritty and grounded and and just a guy trying to live in this world. I mean, I think the source material should should be inspiration more than, you know, a hard rule to follow most of the time. Yeah, I'm okay with people taking risks. The fact that it looked like a beetle so much didn't really bother me. The wings were silly. The wings look so goofy. And then it ripped the wings off. And then it just didn't have wings anymore, which seemed crazy to me. Like, can't the suit the suit can make anything. But once you rip the wings off, it can't make wings again. Mm -hmm. The rules of the suit make no. There's nothing going on with the suit. It makes no sense. They they kind of talk like at first it runs through these tests and it doesn't even really communicate to him. It doesn't respond to him. Also, his dad is like, you have to you have to merge with it. But their relationship doesn't merge. It's just a cool CGI thing Mm -hmm. where the suit crawls all over him and in him and now they're one physically but emotionally you never get the satisfaction of seeing them find any common ground any (laughs) anything anything that relates them to each other it's weird man should we uh should we talk about speaking of trope should we talk about how many things how many marvel movies we can match to uh this movie like from what they took from and oh yeah (laughs) i'd love to would love to. Do you think they did enough to differentiate Blue Beetle from Iron Man? Uh, only, only because of the parts that were lifted from Spider-Man. <laughs> what do you mean? He really, this, I mean, this really bears a lot of similarity to the mcu version of spider-man specifically homecoming where he's talking to the suit and the suit was developed by tony stark which to be fair the blue beetle comic did do first they did that with the blue beetle comic in like 2000 what six or seven and that take on spider-man spider-man having a voice inside a suit that he can talk to I, i can't remember if he had a system like that when he was in the iron spider suit around the same time period but i really don't think it was deployed certainly not when he was a high schooler like they did in homecoming yeah but it's not a groundbreaking concept right like tony stark was talking to the iron man suit before that wasn't he yeah yeah so we can we can probably still count that toward iron man I don't know. And all the shots through the visor, the visor looked terrible, dude. I would be losing my mind if I had to look through that visor every single day. It's crazy. It's crazy how crappy it is. It looks like the kind of thing. It looks like a video game. We would play it like Barcade where yeah. they've got like the guns mounted on something and you're shooting, but everything's a little blurry. And there's like little rocket symbols in the bottom, mm-hmm. <laughs> like your health meter at the top. It looked corny as hell. Dude, it looked like a Capri Sun commercial. Everything was wibbly wobbly and it was like radioactive neon yellow for the interface yeah i guess it looked alien it definitely didn't look like a human interface but still i don't know it it didn't look cool they accomplished something that was different but i think you also had this obligation to not just 
clear the bar. You got to clear the bar and you also got to make it look really cool. Yeah, it looked like a human trying to make something that looked like an alien made it. I feel like it, it looked it looked super corny to me. Do you yeah, have any other so like superhero? The, no. I was going to say, are you counting the interface as one of the things that it lifted for Iron Man? It seems similar to Iron Man. I think I was also wondering about the like corporate espionage thing. You know, we've got like. I feel like there's only so many big corporations too, right? Isn't it kind of mm. funny? I guess it's a kind of a thing in comics where just, you know, Moon Knight or whatever isn't doesn't he have his own corporation? Uh um oh man. Iron Fist uh, definitely does. Iron Fist has his own corporation. I think Spider-Man makes one, Fantastic Spider-Man 4 does have make one. one for sure. It seems like it seems like people just kind of make corporations for certain characters just to play that role. And this felt like another, you know, Cord Tech, Stark Tech just a big a fight for a company. It just felt like uh, the whole feud with Jebediah at the beginning and fighting over this suit and we want this energy. Oh, there's the reactor. You got to build me a reactor. He built this with a bunch of scraps. Like, why did this kid activate it? I don't know. It seemed seemed kind of the same. They're also building the antithesis to him with this guy who's like tortured and trying to get back from his family. That felt very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that felt kind I mean, of like talking, I guess if we're talking direct scenes, there's him flying too far out of the Earth's atmosphere and then coming crashing back down to Earth from the first Iron yeah. Man. There's him cutting the bus in half, which is directly from Doctor Strange. Yeah, there's I feel like so much of the energy of the character can be traced directly back to Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, maybe that's it. I don't know. I thought we were rattling off more after the movie. Now it's been now it's been a week since we've seen it, so I'm a little. It's already it's already drifting away. I feel like we were rattling them off after them. Could be. Yeah, it definitely. I I don't know. It felt like it owed a lot to these other movies that had come before it, but it didn't necessarily feel like it ever overcame being the sum of those parts as a superhero movie. I think as a family movie showing the Reyes family. I thought it was great. I thought all the stuff with them was really nice. I really cared about them. I, again, would be happy to see them. Them outside when Jaime starts, or he's like going to Cord Industries to start what he thinks is his new job there. And they're all <laughs> outside in the truck and they're honking and chanting his name. It was super fun. It was super charismatic. I really liked that. Honestly, the best part of the movie was them dropping him off and, and all the scenes of like the house that that was something that also felt unique. I can't think of too many other superheroes who had that kind of family behind them, right? Yeah. It all it's also a bummer they have to fridge his dad. Like that doesn't seem necessary. I don't think it was. Yeah. I think they could have kept him alive for sure. It was so I I real quick, I just want to talk about the way that this guy dies. I think it really robs the movie of more gravity to have him die while Jaime is in a suit and has a giant grab it claw machine around him. And there's a bunch of people in not just like SWAT uniforms, but you know, the weird kind of spacey helmets that really go out of their way to make them look quasi futuristic. And Mm -hmm. I think all those little pieces that one by one remove us from reality, take us out of that scene. Whereas I think if Jaime was out of the suit, let's say the claw was a different sort of device. Let's say it was like a little, some sort of like a little beacon that they could put on him that would shut down the scarab. So he gets hit with this little thing and it's tiny, it's barely noticeable and it causes the suit to retract back into the scarab. So Jaime's just there. And let's say he's getting restrained by a couple SWAT people and the SWAT people look a little less spacey. I think that that brings us back into a space where it allows us to have more humanity, more of a connection to the real world. And we get to feel more of the gravity of that real moment. But it just feels so inherently ridiculous to have someone in a practical effects superhero costume, (laughs) like writhing on the ground while their dad is dying. It's just it's too much of a clash in my brain. It also seems weird to me that the dad died when Jaime is not there. Like Jaime is taken away and then the dad dies. And so he only finds out his dad died in this weird future scene. So it's like finding out that his dad's dead in that as opposed to like 
the joy of seeing his dad again. Yeah. It's just a different vibe. I and then and then Jaime is gone for like half an hour Mm -hmm. and the family suits up. And then (laughs) again, my favorite part of the whole movie is when they get in the giant beetle and the kickstart, my heart (laughs) starts playing, which, by the way, the music in this, who's who's picking it? It's crazy. It's It's all over the place. And they're like, okay, let's kick it up a gear. And then the the ball they had, the beetle has legs and just starts walking incredibly slowly and incredibly (laughs) slowly. It goes up a wall and incredibly slowly it steps on this guy. And that's five minutes it's the duration of kickstart my heart and the whole time it just it's like you can't play kickstart my heart and then just walk for four minutes or whatever it was <laughs> it was so stupid so i was like, expecting more for the drop it had kevin i got a question for you though oh man Maybe. this is it's way this is way down there blue beetle or ant man and the wasp quantum mania oh it's better than ant man and the wasp it's better than Ant-Man and the Wasp. I thought Ant-Man and the Wasp was garbage. Oh, man. Ugh, I disagree. Better or worse than the Avatar, than Avatar Way of the Water. Mm, and Evil Dead think, Rising is right above it with the Flash. I think the Flash is better. Yeah, I do think the Flash is better. Purely because sure. of Batman. Evil yeah. Dead Rising, I think, is, is better. I think Evil Dead Rising is better for sure. I think Avatar is better. If you're in the mood for that sort of thing, I think it's better. I I think it belongs between Avatar and Ant-Man. Okay, I'll take it there. It's right at the bottom below the air, (laughs) below the air meridian. And I think that's where it's going to stay. Wow. (laughs) Kevin, any thoughts? Uh, No, that's it for me. I, I guess my only last thought is just that it's obviously cool that they're finally doing a movie for the Latino community. And I'm sad it's not better. Because, <laughs> yeah, come on. I mean, it seemed like uh, there were definitely, you know, there's definitely references that went over my head. It seems like a lot of people in our theater were connecting with a lot of the references and really liking it. That's super cool. I just wish that, you know, the story structure and the mechanics of the movie itself were better to take those and let them be awesome parts of an awesome movie and not stand out parts of a very very uneven and shaky movie how yeah. about you Any I'd, last I'd love to see this character and his family again in something yeah. good same here I think it'd be great yeah could totally work how about you listener do you agree with us did you hate Blue Beetle did you love it let us know send us an email nerdy430 at gmail.com we will read it on the next mailbag episode which is coming up soon we'll be back here again next week with the Indian historical drama Starter Udom. Till then, stay nerdy, everybody. Bye.